Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Goodliffe. I'll be your host today. Um, I am uh, a senior trade advisor based at the British Embassy in Stockholm, uh, working for the UK government. My role is to help promote UK exports and to largely support the UK-Sweden bilateral relationship. I'm delighted to be hosting this workshop on the theme of enabling advanced air mobility through innovative infrastructure and I'm really pleased to be working with Urban Airport, Hyundai and What Three Words this afternoon. When I first heard about Urban Airport I thought it looked really exciting with a range of applications that you'll hear about shortly. Also it's received a UK government backing with the initial demonstration facility due to be completed by the end of this year. I was further compelled by the journey that the company had made in terms of the support that had managed to garner and the ecosystem within which it, had, it uh, has had to operate, including dealing with multiple UK stakeholders on the regulatory side. We felt it would be a great fit with Nordic Edge's focus on the innovations that can be tomorrow's reality. A lot of companies are looking at the vehicle side of things, both in terms of drones and FTOLs, that's electric uh, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. But suitable infrastructure will be vital, as well as having a simple way of finding and plotting the destination. So that basic premise, marrying up ground infrastructure with the vehicles and, and a simple way of uh, dealing with location, was what laid the foundations for this session. Hyundai is a leader in FTOL development and one of Air Urban Airport's partners, so it was a natural step to include them. And um, whilst the idea for the workshop was an early stage, I saw a presentation about what three words with its novel system for geolocation and the fact that it's even helped the UK emergency services to save lives by being, to able, by being able to quickly pinpoint individuals in distress. It occurred to me that urban air mobility may make little use of street names, but it would need precise coordinates for the landing sites. So I made some introductions and here we are. Now you'll be pleased to hear you won't be hearing from me all afternoon. Who you will be hearing from are Stuart Bloomfield, Chief Development Officer from Urban Airport, Matt Sattler, a Manager of Infrastructure and Ecosystems Partnerships at Hyundai's uh, Urban Air Mobility Division, and Phoebe Parry Crook, Partnerships Manager at What Three Words. So there'll be those three presentations uh, with some time for questions at the end. And I'd like to ask you to please post any questions in the chat. And I will pass over without further ado to Stuart. Thank you. <clears throat> Next slide, please, I think. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Alan, for the kind introduction. My name is Stuart Bloomfield, and I am the Chief Development Officer for Urban Airport. I'm very happy to be speaking to you here today as part of the On The Move programme. I'd also like to thank the whole team at Nordic Edge for organising this wonderful conference, and my fellow presenters Matt and Phoebe from Hyundai Air Mobility and What Three Words. I'd like to talk to you today about the exciting new era of urban air mobility and how this new era in aviation will demand a totally new type of infrastructure. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Urban Airport is a UK based startup committed to designing, developing, and manufacturing innovative zero emission ground infrastructure for future urban air mobility. Our mission is to remove the largest single constraint to sustainable air mobility, i.e., the lack of infrastructure, in order to significantly cut congestion and air pollution from both passenger and cargo transport. Lack of infrastructure is the single largest barrier to the adoption of urban air mobility within cities. By building the infrastructure today, we can enable low cost and ultra convenient urban mobility that will help us to meet climate targets. Next slide, please. I would firstly like to talk you through the main key markets. Passenger air taxi services is the most widely talked about market and the one that receives both the most press coverage and the largest share of the public imagination. 
This is also what is usually being referred to when people mention urban air mobility or flying cars. Passenger air taxi services may be further subdivided into intercity or regional air mobility between two urban areas, or perhaps between an urban area and another form of transport, such as an airport shuttle. Secondly, intracity air taxi or air metro services. These may be either scheduled ride, service, ride share services between urban airports within a city or an on-demand taxi service within the city. Following that, we have logistics. Logistics aircraft come in a wide range of sizes and payloads, from small autonomous delivery drones to much larger cargo and logistics versions of eVTOL fixed wing aircraft being developed for longer, longer range deliveries. The logistics drone eVTOL market is set to revolutionize the supply chain within and between our cities, targeting the first stroke last mile as well as the middle mile sectors. Additionally, we are developing an urban airport version called Resilience One for use in disaster emergency management situations. Our infrastructure can be positioned as forward operating bases to provide an emergency response where traditional infrastructure has been damaged in order to support, to support disaster relief operations such as reconnaissance, medical, food and water deliveries, mobile clinics, and eventually air evacuation hubs. Further use cases may include oil spill response and forest fires. Next slide, uh, next slide please. Uh, I'd like to talk a little about where the industry currently sits. The key point to remember is that investment into urban air mobility is rapidly advancing. Lack of investment into infrastructure risks choking this growth. The Evatol and drone market is estimated to be worth over $1 trillion by 2040, according to reports from Morgan Stanley. However, NASA estimates that more than 70% of the potential urban air mobility market value is dependent upon adequate infrastructure. The Advanced Air Mobility Investment Dashboard, published by Lufthansa Innovation Hub, records over $5 billion in disclosed funding already so far in 2021. This accounts for over 70% of the total amount of all investment activity to date in just this year alone. However, less than 3% of this amount has been invested into infrastructure. Almost all investment so far has gone into the aircraft. We at Urban Airport are on a mission to change that. The graph on the slide is from the Advanced Air Mobility Reality Index. It shows the number of advanced air mobility orders publicly announced to date. This shows that interest is not coming only from investors, but is translating into actual industry purchases. Next slide, please. In terms of timing, the urban air mobility market is progressing rapidly. The first EVTOLs are expected to be commercialized in the next three to five years. Joby Aviation, the US-based US aerospace startup, plans to launch a commercial air taxi service in 2024. This timing to market is matched by key rivals, including Volocopter and Archer. Hyundai have a current timeline for commercialization by 2028. The logistics market is further ahead with small autonomous drones already undergoing a large number of live test beds and sandboxes worldwide. In April this year, UPS, the global logistics giant, announced a deal to purchase 150 EVTOL vehicles from Beta Technologies for delivery in 2024. These aircraft will cut delivery times and allow access to smaller markets, demonstrating the growing maturity of the sector. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, thanks. <clears throat> uh, so you may be asking yourself, how are we going to do all of that? The answer to that is that we already are. In January of 2021, Urban Airport was selected as one of the winners of the UK government's Future Flight Challenge, organized by UK Research and Innovation. The funding grant was awarded to develop aviation infrastructure and systems to enable the next generation of electric and autonomous air vehicles. Our program is called Air One. Air One will be the world's first fully operational hub for EVATOL 
aircraft and drones. The objectives are to reduce inner city congestion, to cut air pollution from urban transport, to help achieve a zero carbon future, to provide seamless journeys and more efficient logistics operate operations. Urban airport infrastructure will also support other modes of EVs, including cars, bikes, and scooters, becoming not only an EVTOL agnostic hub, but an EV agnostic hub. Next slide, please. Air One will launch in the heartlands of the UK in the city of Coventry in early 2022, during the UK City of Culture celebrations for the year 2021-22. Urban Airport chose Coventry for the first site due to its important location in the heart of the UK and because it is an important hub for the automobile and aerospace industry with a pool of people and skills that can support the manufacturing industries of the future. The city's unique location also provides easy access to most parts of the country. In December 2020, Coventry was named the best UK town for electric cars. Next slide, please. The ambitious Air One project will bring together industry, government and the public together to demonstrate how to unlock the potential of sustainable urban air mobility to holistically decarbonize transport while providing seamless passenger journeys and deliveries. Next slide, please. We will invite a wide guest list of VIPs, city authorities and investors to join us at Air One and experience the future of air mobility for the first time. In addition, students from around the UK will be invited to visit to stimulate their awareness of STEM and inspire them, uh, and inspire them to help create a brighter and more sustainable future. With our research partners at Coventry University, Urban Airport aims to further public understanding and acceptance of the new technology, a key factor to its ultimate success. Our Air, Pro, our, our Air One program includes the design, development and manufacture of a functional prototype urban airport, installation and operation demonstration at an urban site, innovative design and manufacturing techniques, proof of the technical and operational feasibility of dynamic logistics, passenger and humanitarian scenarios, justification of the viability of the business model through intensive real world installation and testing, and the demonstration of the strength of urban airports partnerships with Hyundai and other air mobility ecosystem players. We further plan to showcase how our technology can impact local communities. Each urban airport has the potential to create many new jobs, including in drone technology, R&D, real estate and STEM. The eventual network of sites will create a new booming urban air mobility sector, including manufacture, engineering, communications and site management, thus supporting a smart cities green economic program. Next slide, please. To recap and conclude, I would like to highlight again the key USPs of our unique technology. Our cost effective compact design can allow this exciting new form of transport to be integrated into our smart cities of the future and combine with our existing transport and logistics infrastructure as part of a consolidated citywide multimodal network. Air taxis and logistics drones have highly accurate vertical takeoff and landing capabilities, so do not need any runways or large landing areas, allowing urban airport sites to be positioned in the areas of greatest demand and close to connecting infrastructure, such as rail hubs. Evitol aircraft are also up to 100 times quieter than conventional aircraft. We provide an ultra compact, rapidly deployable multifunctions hub for manned and unmanned vehicles, providing aircraft command and control, charging and refueling, and passenger and cargo loading. Our design is both vehicle and infrastructure operator agnostic to accommodate the maximum amount of flexibility for the full range of future potential operators and partners. Our technology can be implemented by airports, cities, real estate owners, transport operators, and logistics distribution centers, among many others. Additional flexibility is provided by the possibility of being on or off grid, 
of being both scalable and modular, meaning also that urban airports can be upgraded in the future to meet changing user needs. Our infrastructure can also be deployed in almost all possible sites within a smart city, including floating and rooftop versions, and may be moved within an existing site or to an entirely new location within a city or countrywide network. Next slide, please. Cars need roads, trains need rails, planes need airports, and evatolls need urban airport. Thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to answering your questions following the other presentations. Please contact me using the address on the screen if you would like to discuss further, or by using the LinkedIn shortcut on the speaker page. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, it's really fascinating to see the, the journey you've been going through over the last few years and, uh, and where it's leading to. And I'm really looking forward to getting over to Coventry when travel restrictions allow easy travel uh, to be able to go and see it. Um, so I'd like to pass on uh, to uh, Matt uh, Sattler from Hyundai. Um, take us further into the, into the vehicles uh, aspect. Great. Thanks, okay. Alan. And hello, everyone. Excited to be here on behalf of Hyundai Motor Group um, and our urban air mobility division. We are a division that's dedicated to powering human-centered cities through multimodal innovation. And of course, we're doing that by serving as a vehicle OEM and then also as an infrastructure um, provider in various ways. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but this is largely about our ecosystem and infrastructure um, approach to building this ecosystem around advanced air mobility with many of our very close friends like Urban Airport. And uh, just a huge thanks to Alan, the Nordic Edge Expo team, and um, Stuart and Phoebe um, for uh, joining us today. So thanks again. And Alan, if we could move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so Hyundai Motor Group has been at the forefront of innovation and plans to continue this legacy as a global leader in air mobility. So if you go back to the 1940s when Hyundai was originally founded, we were actually founded as an engineering and construction firm rebuilding bridges and tunnels following the Korean War. And then in the mid 1960s, we expanded our ambitions to be able to build transportation infrastructure abroad. And then, um, you know, sort of if we're building roads in, in foreign countries, why not also build vehicles? So in the 1960s, uh, we actually launched the vehicle manufacturing company. Um, in 1976, we uh, released Pony, which was Korea's first mass produced car. And then um, kind of continuing to expand and grow, um, we've always had this commitment to kind of um, quality and innovation. And so in 1999, we, we launched the automotive industry's best um, leading warranty and that has continued to permeate all the way until today. A little more recently we've um, started to look at um, you know leaning into technologies of the future and I guess you know that has been a continuous trend but really more most recently we've talked a lot about our autonomous vehicle capabilities um, something that we tested at a first full-scale test in 2018. And then we've also been really focused on alternate energy. So both the group investing both in electric powertrains and hydrogen um, fuel cells for ground and potentially eventually air vehicles as well. Um, and then a little bit earlier this year, we also announced um, that our Genesis premium luxury brand is actually planning to phase out ICE vehicle production by 2030. Um, with our last ICE model being introduced in 2025. So continuing to, to really lead the way in the incumbent industries that we have uh, played in over the course of our history. And Alan, to the next slide, please. So UAM um, focuses really on solving fundamental mobility issues. And as we look around cities today, what we've noticed is the primary issues are increased congestion from traffic, perhaps not so much in COVID, but as we've seen people come back to more normal lives, a lot of that congestion continues to return. That congestion also causes significant productivity losses, particularly in tier one cities where we're seeing people spend multiple hours of their day, whole kind of thirds of their day, um, certainly of their work day in traffic before coming to and from um, their work locations. 
And, you know, this environment also creates a lot of uh, public safety challenges and traffic accidents. So while we're on this call, you know, probably several dozen people will have a car accident um, and potentially actually have some fatalities from that. Um, so, you know, really, really kind of an opportunity as well to think about how we can transform the, the public safety and, uh, and, and traffic, um, you know, safety standards. And then of course, the theme um, that we're all kind of focused on emissions, right? So ICE vehicles um, certainly contribute a significant portion of uh, transportation emissions. We think there's a roadmap to do better and that's why we're, here. we're all here. Um, and Alan, if you could go to the next slide, please. UAM offers a really interesting um, and creative set of solutions that I think will help um, with these issues. And, and this is one of kind of many um, mobility solutions that we think are in the toolkit, but UAM opens up this third dimension. So it, it very much allows us to move into the air from the ground. We can shorten those commute times, particularly in a world where folks are not needing to go into the office every day. They can actually start to expand and move further out from town, um, knowing that they have this fast connection option. Um, it becomes a really great corporate tool uh, for folks that are traveling on business, particularly getting to and from you know, airports in you know, wider kind of urban centers. So you think about somewhere like Los Angeles or San Francisco Bay Area, um, a lot of opportunity to connect the dots and, and help improve productivity. Uh, we've already talked about the improved safety. You know, we hold ourselves um, to the same standards as existing aircraft, existing commercial transport category aircraft. That will um, translate over into, you know, orders of magnitude higher safety standards than what we see in, in road traffic today. And it's significantly safer to, to fly in a transport category aircraft than it is to, to be in a ground vehicle. And then as we've talked about, you know, on the emissions front, we are leading the way you know, with our ground transportation um, technologies, but taking those fuel cells and battery packs and electric motors and putting them into the vehicle. We'll talk about why the innovation in that space is really important um, here shortly. And Alan, to the next slide, please. So we've um, made a long-term commitment to developing this UAM space. And I think we're one of the few automotive OEMs that have you know, done that really directly, but it all centers around the group's wider vision to build human-centered cities. And I think that's somewhat unique for a car company because um, you know, so much of our lifeblood and infrastructure has been really associated with um, the existing development of roads, the existing deployment of automotive vehicles, but we actually think the future is really about the human and the uh, modes of transportation that go to support that are really going to be all about um, you know, the, the human and making sure that they can connect in many different ways, both people and goods. Um, and so that's, that's really what this is all about. And this is one of, again, several products that we think come together to build this ecosystem. Um, you know, through that, we're essentially focusing on innovation and initiative um, to optimize vehicle development. And, you know, the, the critical outcomes are sustainability, scalability, affordability, and access to transportation systems. So I think a lot of people still don't have access either for economic reasons or for geographic reasons um, to sufficient transportation that would really enhance their lives. And, um, and that's, you know, a really big group theme as well. And Alan, to the next slide, please. So this is SA1, our concept uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle design. We released this at CES in 2019, maybe 2020, <laughs> years run together in COVID. Uh, but this is a fully electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. And um, you know, you'll notice that it has several motors and rotors all around the vehicle. There's a reason for that. And it is uh, to take advantage of that electric propulsion um, system and the distributed electric propulsion. What that allows us to do is actually create both safety and redundancy throughout the vehicle design. And it also allows us to um, use and employ um, electric motors, which are con considerably cheaper to operate than gas turbine engines or piston engines and a lot more reliable than, than both of those. It, it also significantly helps with things like overhauls that are 
um, huge cost drivers for traditional propulsion systems. So, you know, this wouldn't have been possible even 10 years ago without the evolution of, of battery technology and certainly continued battery density improvements. That's also part of the reason why we're targeting a, a 2028 entry into service. We think that this system, while sufficient for certain missions today, will actually continue to get better, particularly in the area of battery density. And, um, and we think that there's a, a strong technology roadmap to get there. And so late decade entry into service allows us to take advantage of, of those changes and deploy that um, in what we think will be a really deliberate second mover vehicle um, that's going to be really successful for this space. The vehicle is also enabled by autonomy, which really is all about reducing cost and improving safety. And when we say enabled by autonomy, we're not talking about a fully pilotless aircraft. We are talking about building into the um, aircraft's architecture a flight control system that is highly automated and highly safe. And this is something we've seen in transport category airplanes come to life over the last several decades, you know, really with Airbus leading the way in the mid 1980s on its A320 program and in the predecessors that came even before that, kind of with that system architecture in mind. Um, and we're just taking it one step further, kind of in step. So we anticipate this to be a piloted vehicle initially, eventually transitioning to a remotely operated vehicle, and then eventually a one to many ratio where you basically have folks monitoring the status of the vehicle from the ground as air traffic controllers do today. But we're not taking that all at once. We're taking it in, in chunks as the technology is matured and the regulators agree it's a safe environment for us to do that. But really kind of building the vehicle with that future architecture in mind. We're prioritizing five or four key areas, I suppose, for this. Um, and it has to be safe. Fundamentally, that's the first priority. It has to be quiet, you know, and I think this has been a big barrier to helicopters today. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It has to be affordable and accessible, and it has to be passenger centric. And I think, you know, so many of the existing aircraft that we've talked about, um, you know, both in the helicopter space and also early entrance in the eVTOL space have struggled to make all of those things work. And I think that's really why we're also looking at, at, at doing this a little bit later decade, again, as, a, as a, a deliberate second mover, really wanting to build the right vehicle that can be scaled. And you know, as we think about um, a few of the other technologies that are likely to be matured before the end of the decade, there are, some, there are several things um, that you know, probably aren't quite ready yet for prime time. So I think about things like anti-ice technology, um, you know, that's something that we've seen deployed on small aircraft, but in a way that's really difficult to scale. Um, and so I think, you know, there could be creative solutions to a problem like that that are likely to be certifiable a little bit later in the decade. And that would help um, these vehicles serve colder weather climates, operate in IFR um, operations instrument flight rules. So things of that nature, I think, that, that just need a little bit more time to mature. Um, and we have a lot of opportunity to, to take and, and capture as we bring to, to life. And Alan, um, next slide, please. So the value chain for UAM, we think spans a few areas. So um, certainly the vehicle and subsystems, the operations component, and there we talk a little bit about fleet operations and infrastructure operations, so vertiports and airlines effectively aftermarket and MRO services, and then physical infrastructure. And, um, you know, we are employing a strategic partnerships approach throughout this value chain. So we're not looking to vertically integrate everything. There are certain core competencies that we will look to um, use and employ ourselves. But there are um, many things that we believe can be um, best suited through a village approach. And that's um, why we're here talking with, with um, Urban Airport and what three words today. Um, and so our objective here is really to leverage Hyundai Motor Group's experience, resource and knowledge bases to um, build this entire ecosystem. And this is a really big differentiator in our approach from um, other folks as well, is that we believe this, this uh, um, ecosystem can only come together, this business case can only come together if we focus on building the whole ecosystem, we focus on building the whole business case. And so what we're doing is basically taking individual areas throughout the value chain and ranging those from ownership, things that we should do ourselves because 
Hyundai Motor Group has some core capability in it. We're going to be able to scale it well to influencing the space and um, you know to just outsourcing the function completely. And there are things that I think exist like, across that value chain. We'll talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, but you know, for example, I think in the influence space, one thing that we're looking to do is um, influence partners in airspace management. So we we have no um, history in the airspace management world. We think there needs to be some reforms and changes to densify the airspace and make sure that everyone has access um, to that airspace equally and that it can support this, this level of vehicle operations that are being proposed. But Hyundai Motor Group doesn't um, you know, think that we can drive that directly. Instead, what we think makes sense is to have a really open posture about the in-state that needs to exist and basically um, work with everyone in the space that is, is doing great work on this um, to, you know, to really um, reform that space and inform policy making decisions going forward. We've announced one, a partnership in this space um, with a company called Anora Technologies. There will be several more that will follow up and it ties heavily into our work with Urban Airport and uh, the Coventry project as well because there's a digital component of that. And so we're really trying to stitch together several of these things across the ecosystem. And next slide, please. So, you know, we have a lot to do. So if you look across the ecosystem, there are um, a number of areas that we need to address. And so just to give you a quick overview of how we're thinking about that, we're currently in the process of scoping the requirements for the ecosystem, meeting partners, and developing relationships with partners who can help us co-build the ecosystem, which again, I think is the crux of our partnership with uh, Urban Airport, where we, we very much view um, it as a synonymous, you know, bringing together of the ecosystem, but we don't have a, a view that those um, infrastructure components will be closed, right? We think that the system needs to be shared across both operators and OEMs, vehicle OEMs. Um, otherwise, it's it's just going to be impossible to scale this um, business case to to the same level. I mean, you wouldn't build a road that only Audis could drive on, right? Um, so that's that's very much how we're thinking about it, and. Um, Next slide, please. Just to touch on another area that we think is critically important, you know, we, we really need to dig in and work with our regulatory counterparts across the space, and, and that's um, what we're doing. So we're working both at a federal level and then at a regional, state, local, pro provincial level. Um, with individual governments to basically unblock the key things that are going to be needed in this business case. And so those areas have taken, um, you know, a couple of, of key underpinnings. And, and we think very much um, infrastructure development, you know, we need to work with our local counterparts to, to think about how do we ease the building and permitting processes? How do we integrate um, innovative solutions like the modular vertiports that Urban Airport is proposing. Um, how do we think about, you know, uh, integrating to existing transportation systems, things like train stations, uh, building in, in locations where we can create mobility hubs and not just individual isolated areas, but also being creative about what those business cases are and how we think about them. Um, and then we've also, you know, thought a lot about um, how we create public awareness for UAM. I think it's it's quite likely that several folks on this call only started hearing about the UAM business case in the last year or so. Um, certainly in the general public and the representative general public, um, this is still quite an unknown um, business case. And, and I think it's been difficult for folks to identify with how they might engage with the case as well. And so, you know, it's really about informing people what this technology can do, how it can complement existing mobility methods, and then, you know, what its impacts will be. So how noisy is it really? How much, how many emissions will it produce? What will the visual pollution look like? And I think, you know, working alongside our, our counterparts, both in traditional aviation and in other areas of the startup ecosystem, like drones, for instance, to, to help educate um, the public and, and help get them excited about what this case can do because it is quite a transformational technology. Um, and then, you know, this, this clarity on um, multi-jurisdictional governance is quite a difficult challenge. So 
if you go and talk to a state or a local government, what you will find is that they very much have an opinion about whether or not this vehicle can operate, where it can operate, and what acceptable noise standards are. But the air is generally the jurisdiction of a civil aviation authority. So in the United States, that's like the FAA. Um, and so what, a large part of what we're doing is basically bringing those various stakeholders to the table to create um, you know, policy decisions that work for every stakeholder. And so making sure that we're not forgetting about anyone um, and making sure again, you know, that, that what's being created is really addressing kind of the problem universally. And then, you know, the last piece, which I think is um, quite challenging because it represents a, a really big change to how we do things today is building this roadmap to multimodal integration. And, you know, as we sort of think about multimodal integration, you know, the, the challenge is, is largely around distribution, right? So we have ideas of, um, you know, ordering a, an Uber or a Lyft through, um, through a mobile app, but we really don't buy airplane tickets that way. And we generally tend to plan longer journeys beyond just something that's intercity, um, kind of in a, in a more expanded you know, environment on the web. And so there's this big question of like, how do we actually create that infrastructure and how do we make sure that it works both from a security and regulatory perspective and also from a commercial perspective. Um, and so that's, that's an area that we're spending a lot of brain power on right now. And Alan, to the next slide, please. So in terms of timing, you know, just to wrap things up, Stuart um, described that we're talking about a 2028 entry into service for our vehicle. What we're doing here now in 2021 and 2023 is wrestling with a lot of these big um, questions that we've talked about today, really defining a roadmap to solving those questions and, and building the ecosystem alongside the vehicle's development timeline. And that involves a lot of testing and a lot of demonstration activity. So our, we're super excited for our first physical demonstration in Coventry in the UK. Our SA1 mock-up will be there. Um, we'd love for you to, to stop by if you can to see it. Um, but you know that that's kind of on um, the physical infrastructure side of the house. We'll also be looking to do demonstrations for digital infrastructure, so urban uh, unmanned traffic management systems. We'll be looking to test various components of the vehicle through subscale prototypes and um, tech demonstrators over this time period. And then, kind of in the mid-decade period, you know, 2024 to 2026, we'll be rolling out um, several test vehicles and starting the certification process um, for a vehicle with a targeted 2027, late 2027, early 2028 entry into service. Uh, and then from there, this is all about commercial acceptance and scaling. And I think that's something that Hyundai Motor Group has done quite well um, over, over its time. And we're uh, hoping to leverage that expertise as we bring this case to market. So thanks again, looking forward to um, asking uh, or answering some questions a little bit later on. Thank you, Matt. Again, very, very interesting. And I did see that there were some questions coming in the chat. So we'll take them, like I said, a little, little bit later on. Um, some of what you were saying there was very much the focus on the human. And I think that's a quite a nice segue into what Phoebe is going to be talking about with what three words and really getting to know where, well, in some cases where people are. So uh, I'll pass on to Phoebe. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. And thanks, Stuart and Matt as well. Um, really great uh, presentations from you both. Um, sorry, just. There we go. Um, so having looked at the physical infrastructure required for urban air uh, mobility um, sort of with urban airports and Hyundai, uh, I will actually be talking about how newer, the new addressing solution, what three words, uh, can help uh, communicate precise locations, landing points anywhere in the world. Next slide, please. So looking at the agenda for uh, what I'll be talking about, um, I'll first be starting with the problems that we have with the existing addressing infrastructure, um, then moving on to talking and explaining a bit more about the, the solution that I'm proposing today, what two words, um, and then how it's currently being used um, sort of around the world, but also specifically in the urban uh, mobility space already. Next slide, please. 
So um, as this slide says, many parts of the world don't have an address. Uh, traditional addresses are part of the essential infrastructure behind transporting both people and things. However, we do often overlook the fact that uh, they were designed hundreds of years ago and are not always fit for purpose, uh, particularly within the context of what we're talking about today, um, urban mobility. They were designed for the postal service and, and getting around uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, so, you know, Many, many times when you're trying to communicate a location, uh, the information that you might have, uh, if it's the A11 or you know, uh, Highway 101, that is a very uh, long stretch of road to be able to communicate, which isn't going to be fit for purpose when trying to specify a specific landing site. Uh, and the same for a forest or a field, uh, those are areas of the world that do not have an address. And that is fine when you're trying to get off the grid, but when we're trying to specify really, really precise locations, that is a solution that's not going to work. And even in areas where there are, are large settlements, um, this is actually a rhino refugee camp, um, there are no traditional street addresses. So many parts of the world just do not have addressing infrastructure. Um, and this is really critical when people are trying to communicate where they are, whether it's an emergency situation or simply uh, a need for basic resources or just traveling to that location. And that can be particularly problematic. But it's not just urban, uh, rural areas and, and uh, areas like the Rhino refugee camp, it is also urban areas. Uh, this is, these are some examples in the UK, a area of the world which is traditionally thought to be very well addressed. Um, but as you can see there in the top right, um, we have the issues with things like duplicated street addresses. And this is something that's around the world. So in London, we have 16 church roads alone, uh, but you can also see on the screen that's an issue in, in Liverpool where there are seven of them. In Mexico City, there are over 600 Juarez streets. Um, and I know that in Cape Town, there's a lot of uh, Joubert streets. And this can be really, really confusing if you're not familiar with the area, trying to get a, uh, a delivery. And you know, in the context of today, uh, if you're trying to communicate specifically where um, a drone or an urban, urban uh, EV toll is taking off from or landing from, uh, that's going to be really problematic if you're landing in the wrong church road. Um, down at the bottom there, you also have issues with kind of new buildings, um, many areas and uh, new construction areas will not be traditionally uh, addressed for up to six to 18 months. Um, and again, this is really, really problematic for people who are living there, but also for the logistics industry who are trying to deliver goods and services to that area. You can also have uh, one address and multiple entrances. Uh, you know, if you're trying to type in Wembley, uh, the pin will drop a, a pin in the middle of the stadium, which isn't useful for anyone who's trying to access a specific entrance and a specific site. And something we've also seen is there's a lot of confusions between an avenue, street, and road. Um, when you're communicating an emergency situation, uh, when you're stressed, um, you can often not distinguish between those. And obviously, 100th Avenue is going to be a completely different area to 100th Street or 100th Road. Um, and that is really, really problematic. Obviously, there are solutions out there um, and sharing a pen on a, on a map is a great one. Um, I use WhatsApp sharing live location on a regular basis. However, it's not always possible. Um, and this uh, is particularly the case when you're moving from platform to platform. So if you have multiple stakeholders within a scenario, so if uh, I'm trying to communicate my location over email, but then someone else is trying to communicate it over phone, trying to talk and communicate where that pin is whilst on the phone to someone is really, really difficult to do and often not possible. So there are existing uh, solutions, but they're, they're not always possible to use. And finally, before I move on to sort of explaining what the words a bit further, um, uh, GPS coordinates obviously a fantastic uh, system. They're incredibly precise. They've been around for a really long time. However, not everyone feels comfortable using a GPS coordinate. They're not the most human friendly uh, uh, technology. It's very easy to make an error. And once you've typed in the wrong digit, it's very difficult to detect that you've made that error until it's too late and you've got a drone going to completely the wrong uh, destination. So a great solution, but not always fit for purpose. So going into what three words and then the solution, um, what we have done is we've divided the entire Earth surface into three meter by three meter squares and given each one a unique three word reference. What three words is solving this problem of poor addressing by providing anywhere in the world uh, with a what three words address. So shave, player, copy. And that means that you can, uh, it can be communicated using just three simple words and you can reach that point wherever you are. So 
here I talked about that construction site, that new build, um, you can actually pinpoint either the entrance where an incident has occurred, even a first aid site, um, or a particular drone delivery or takeoff site, um, or even an urban airport. No matter where you are in the world, whether you're in the Atacama Desert or, uh, or Stockholm, you'll be able to use a what through address to communicate exactly where you are. So how does it work? I mentioned GPS coordinates, uh, they're great, uh, but our, and our system's actually based on them. So all we're doing is taking that not particularly human friendly existing system and converting it into three simple words and back again. That's all our tech does. So here you can see that we've taken one degree, uh, 18 seconds, 42.7, north and we've converted that into into towers sensors um already you can hear as i say it over the over this uh, session you can hear how much easier it is to say whether you're using your voice um, and particularly as we move into a, an era where we're increasingly using voice with uh, at home digital devices such as um amazon echoes and, and google nexus um you will be able to use three words much easier and it removes that confusion between you know 100th avenue um and 41st street or 41st Street. Um, so all those confusions that you might have previously had with voice into towers sensors, very easy. And we're available in over 45 languages. I believe actually as of just a few days ago, we are now at 50. Um, so that includes um, you know, French, Spanish, Swedish, Norwegian, Finnish, Danish, uh, and Persian is our most recent one. Um, and that is because we want everyone to be able to talk about what you were at uh, their location in their native tongue. So no matter where they are, they're able to communicate their exact location in their native language. So how can it be used? Um, we have a free app and a free map site, which allows you to search, uh, discover, share, navigate um, at the at what you was address, and it does work offline. So if you don't have any data co uh, coverage, you're still able to discover your current location. And you can see here in the top, uh, top of the search bar, there's a little speech bubble as well. So that's how you can search for a what you was address using your voice, and you can even scan a what you was address as well and search for it there. We also do have our code, which can be integrated into anyone's uh, existing systems. It's really, really simple to integrate and it will allow you to convert a GPS coordinate into a what's your address and back again. And we also have our auto suggest technology, which is all about that error correction. Um, what we have tried to do with our algorithm is uh, shuffle similar sounding three word addresses very far apart from one another. This means that plurals, um, so table, chair, lamps, um, we try and push that as far away from possible as table, chair, lamp to avoid that confusion. Sometimes that's not always possible um, because we do also try and make uh, words like book or lucky in areas of high density of English speakers. And so sometimes we make a trade off there, but that's where our auto suggest comes in. And that allows you that if you've made a typo, if you've misheard uh, someone over the phone, um, it will auto suggest things that it, it's a bit like Google's did you mean? Um, and that will mean that you can take, take a look and it also displays the country and the nearest location underneath it. So you can get that context and realize that you didn't mean a what's your words address in uh, Stockholm, you meant one in Copenhagen, and therefore you can select that what's your words address and just really helping with that error correction and making it as human friendly of a system as possible. So finally, kind of moving into the final section of this, um, I'll be talking about how it's already being used around the world. Um, we're being used by thousands of businesses um, across industries in many different ways. So whether it's a hotel trying to be discovered, um, we've all arrived at hotels and you know, our sat nav said that we're there and actually it takes a very long time to find the exact entrance or even parking spots as well. Um, trying to find the exact entrance of a parking uh, lot or a parking space um, can be particularly difficult, but with what few words, it makes life really, really easy and stress-free. Um, it can also be input into a lot of systems so whether you're a logistics firm so Hermes is a UK logistics company you are able to input your what you was address if you live in a particularly rural location or even if you just have had difficulties with your deliveries in the past and this allows the logistics firm to deliver to the exact entrance or even safe place um, and this is a really interesting concept as we look more to, to drone deliveries uh, where people will be able to you know determine specifically in their garden where is a safe place for a drone to land with a um, parcel 
um, or even sort of on hospitals with, uh, with emergency goods. And it's also been used in kind of day-to-day -day operations. So a lot of construction and infrastructure companies are using what three words um, for instant reporting, health and safety, and also asset mapping. A lot of these companies are working in rural or unaddressed locations, and it allows them to specify sites around uh, so that their workers can really make sure that they're not getting lost. Um, and also working with emergency services as well. So I mentioned that we often work with companies inputting what through as addresses and um, we work with a number of uh, car companies and are already available within a lot of sat navs um, sat navs of four cars which allows you to input with either your voice or a uh, typing in so here with mercedes um, you can get into any mercedes released since 2018 and say hey mercedes take me to filled count soap and that will take you to that exact three meter by three meter square so this kind of is a sort of good hint to kind of the future of air mobility is that it's already in cars, it's already in those incumbent systems like Matt, Matt was talking about earlier, sort of these, these ICE vehicles and electric vehicles. Um, so it's only a matter of time before we start looking at how we need that precise location to make sure that passengers are reaching their exact location that they require. I mentioned that we're already working with a number of emergency services. Um, I saw someone in the in the chat sort of mentioning about that kind of emergency response and how urban air mobility can be used for that. What few words is actually already working in the emergency space um, and are, is recognised and accepted by over 85% of the UK emergency services, but it's not just the UK. We're working in Germany, across the US, Canada, and also Australia, South Africa, Mongolia, even Ukraine, um, to help emergency services really, really pinpoint those uh, specific locations in an emergency situation when someone may be struggling to realise where they are um, or be able to communicate that quickly and uh, succinctly over the phone. Something that we've found uh, very useful within the emergency um, industry uh, with them is, is this interagency communication, providing this common language. A lot of them are using different softwares um, and will need to coordinate on a, on a, a call and an emergency response. Um, it might involve police, fire, emergency, um, ambulance and being able to pass a what through as address from one caller to another, um, just as hugely beneficial in reducing that response time. Um, you can see here that uh, in this particular scenario, they were able to respond very quickly to this um, incident through using what through words with all of the agencies. And I think sort of in the lens of what we're talking about today, there's gonna be many different stakeholders um, as both Matt and Stuart have mentioned. So being, being able to have this common language that can pass through um, is going to be a really interesting way to, to improve and, and make sure that people are getting to where they need to be. So nearly half, actually, 42% of the emergency service uh, call operators that we spoke to when we did a, a survey um, said that they received daily calls where individuals struggled to describe the location of their emergency. Um, and, and this is something that hasn't really been thought about previously. We think that we have very good uh, uh, addressing infrastructure. And as we move to more kind of um, urban mobility spaces, you know, potentially using uh, EV tolls for emergency response, uh, it's really important to be able to make sure that we can pinpoint exactly where emergency callers are. And 74% of those that we surveyed um, of the emergency services agreed that what through words actually helps cuts response time when it matters the most, um, with two control rooms reporting that on average the technology saved their teams more than 10 minutes uh, per call, which is, it doesn't sound like much time, but it's a significant chunk of time when dealing with an emergency scenario. So I mentioned kind of emergency services, um, but I guess looking at how what through us can be used to pinpoint specific uh, locations, um, we've worked a lot with many different businesses, but even here, um, the Nightingales that were set up during COVID, um, we were able to help emergency services and ambulances, but also visitors find exactly where they needed to be going, um, particular areas around site. Um, and I think this is a really interesting case study um, when looking at urban air mobility, being able to pinpoint a specific location um, where someone can navigate to, but really easy communicated as well. So simply just saying stores, logic, healers, and being able to get to an entrance of a location. So I mentioned that we're already being used within kind of um, some of the sectors of urban mobility that Stuart touched on earlier. And one of them is um, within logistics. Um, 
in back in December 2020, we ran a delivery test with um, Royal Mail, Skyports and Drone Prep. Um, this involved uh, using a drone to deliver a parcel to a woman who lived on a very remote lighthouse in Isle of Mull, which is Scotland. Um, in the Isle of Mull, they do have a lot of issues in delivering to this area, given how remote it is. Um, and that if in, there's inclement weather, then they are unable to ship parcels. Um, so this is a really important test where we're actually really um, still carrying it out. Um, and it involves a lot of um, engagement with the local community to um, get them to talk about public perception of drones and urban air mobility and encourage them to uh, really engage with the project and, and work out you know, where on their land uh, can someone land, uh, can they uh, receive a parcel. Um, and it's really about that human engagement from the public. Um, and it's been a really, really interesting project, as I said, still ongoing um, and really excited to see where it goes. So here you can see, um, uh, I was just saying that, you know, we're integrated as well with the drone prep uh, platform. We helped them with the Royal Mail uh, uh, pilot, and um, that allows a member of the public to choose where they would like a um, drone to be delivered on their site. And it helps them by uh, showing where is appropriate if they have any pylons. Obviously, you can't deliver there. But by using What's Your Words, they're able to really specifically pinpoint exactly where is appropriate, and drone prep will return to them whether that is um, suitable or not. Within kind of the drone spread continued, we're also working with people like Galway Civil Defence, where people can actually communicate where an incident has occurred, um, and Galway will um, use a drone to kind of do a search and rescue or um, uh, have a look over and see what how it, what's happened before sending out a team to that site. Obviously, in um, uh, Galway, it's often quite a rural area, um, and this helps really save time and be more efficient. I'm also working in a similar, similar capacity with um, Sorizon, um, who are a software that's often used for um, search and rescue. Um, so being able to provide kind of uh, a specific location where they should be heading to, um, again, in that really human friendly format. So it's very easy for anyone to input, um, whether it's come over the phone on 999 or just it's just easier to use. Um, and then you can also see there's the, the traditional street address alongside it to provide a bit of kind of context to that what you words address. So I think as we kind of move into the more um, increasingly seeing air mobility in our lives, um, I think it's really interesting to see how um, What Through Words creates this more human friendly um, interaction to help people um, plot their routes wherever they're going um, and in, in a more human friendly and uh, with more error detection than some other existing systems. And finally, um, as I said, What Through Words is a system that is incredibly friendly when it comes to voice. Um, you know, when we're ordering and, uh, you know, things over our digital home hubs, it's going to be essential to have a system that is compatible with that. And as, you know, if we are then ordering air mobility EV toll taxis, um, using our voice in our homes, um, you know, having a platform that interacts with that in a really friendly way is going to be essential. So that's everything from me today. Um, and I believe we're opening up the floor to questions. Um, so yeah, please raise hands or write them in the, in the chat. Thank you very much, Phoebe. It's really fascinating. I find that a wonderful system. Uh, so many applications, uh, quite amazing. And I really think it'll make a, a big difference in this um, oh, application that we've just been talking about with the urban air mobility. Um, right, I'm just going to go into the chat for a moment. Just bear with me a second. So I did see there are a few uh, dropping in earlier. Oh, yeah. So um, there are right now. Yeah, so the first one was from Chris. Um, it says, hi, Matt. We're located within a mile of a busy heliport link to a small island group approximately 36 miles away. What are the comparisons for one of your vehicles compared to the AW139 that they currently use, such as on range, cost, bad weather capability, safety, passenger numbers, etc.? 
Yeah, great question. Um, and you know, we, we really haven't talked too much publicly about um, our vehicle performance. I think it's something we're happy to follow up with you offline about, um, particularly under NDA at this stage. But um, you know, broadly, you know, we've modeled this initial business case around the Uber Elevate mission. So you know, I think they outline something like an average of 25 mile stage lengths um, up to kind of 60 miles maximum range. That is um, about where we're targeting kind of for an initial um, brush at this and, and certainly refining that and looking a little bit more broadly. But that's that's uh, kind of the guidance we've given publicly in terms of vehicle capacity. We talked about up to five seats um, on, on the vehicle. And so that that's probably four passenger paying seats with the pilot on board initially. Um, but quite a bit of a different um, operating profile than, than the AW139. Oh, thanks, Matt. And I see that uh, Chris has written in the chat there. Thanks very much. Very much appreciated. Um, and then there was from, um, I wouldn't have to pronounce this rightly, Yup. Um, so the recent EASA survey showed that the urgent medical use case has the highest level of public acceptance. Uh, will Hyundai also aim for that use case? Yeah, another great question. Um, so certainly we think emergency services are a, a really terrific application for this. I think there's been some of our competitors out um, talking about even things like organ transplant and delivery, that is definitely an area that I think we would explore. Um, and I think, you know, we've talked a lot about this as a passenger carrying vehicle, and certainly we, we think it's a mobility forward solution, but, um, you know, that doesn't mean that, that we don't think that there are a bunch of other applications for this as well. I think emergency services um, in particular is, is one that is really low hanging fruit that we can, we can um, serve pretty much immediately you know and you think about um certain zoning and locations right uh, from an infrastructure perspective like the city of san francisco um the only places that you can actually land a helicopter and it's limited hours are at hospitals and so that's that's a natural place for us to to drop our technology into um already so i think certainly an area that we will continue to consider along with um, cargo applications depending on on the area um, and Stuart, I think maybe it might be interesting to talk about kind of the integration with um, with Urban Airport and all the different use cases you all are talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. I think I think you know uh, the key thing to say is that um, as um, Matt touched upon, these networks need to be built to be agnostic for all the different types of drones and, and, and as well as the different types of operators, um, as, as Matt touched upon in his presentation. So for medical um, deliveries, um, it, it could be that it's a larger eVTOL vehicle in the future, but most of those use cases at this point have been the smaller delivery drones, such as the uh, the use case that Phoebe highlighted in the in the Scottish Islands there, um, where you're delivering a, a smaller package um, with a, a smaller unmanned autonomous drone. Um, from the point of urban airport, we are obviously designing it to be as agnostic, agnostic as possible for all those use cases. So that actually the flexibility it allows then for a customer uh, is built in. Um, so if you're, a, if you're, for instance, a small town um, and you wanted to have an urban airport and put urban air mobility into, you know, into the, your transportation infrastructure, you probably wouldn't want to have a whole range of different urban airport solutions based around passenger, cargo, disaster emergency, um, et cetera. You may, but what might be more suitable would be to have um, one or more, you know, fewer numbers of urban airports that are able to actually um, uh, utilize those different use cases within the same infrastructure. That's going to be obviously better from a, a point of view of, of cost, better from a point of view of the land that it takes. And also from an operations point of view, you have then a single point of operations that is actually controlling those flights coming into or out of, a, of, of an area. So I think from, an, um, from the point of view of medical use, there will be sites such as hospitals, which are specifically or very much predominantly focused upon that use case. But actually, when we're talking about smart cities and we're talking about urban solutions, what is a um, probably more practical solution in the future is that it's able to satisfy all of those use cases and actually change the amount of um, uh, 
how much it's focused upon those individual use cases in any situation. So um, at a certain time of the day, you may have more passenger flow through a location. And then at a certain time of day, you may have more cargo and logistics through flow uh, in, the, in that same urban airport. And um, in that case, it also makes it more viable from a business use point, uh, use case, because you're able to obviously generate the, the revenue that's necessary to put that um, infrastructure into a particular location through the more profitable use cases of, of passenger and logistics, but also it's able then to be used in an emergency and it's not sitting idle in the times when there's no emergency uh, that's actually you know in place at that time. So it, it needs to be flexible, um, whether that's Hyundai or a, a different um, uh, OEM. Um, the point is that it's able to actually be flexible for all of those manufacturers. Super, thank you both. And I see that uh, Yap has uh, answered there in the chat as well. Thanks, Matt. We're now using two conventional helicopters, so Egotol would be much appreciated. Um, I actually had a few questions that haven't appeared in the chat, but were sent to me prior. Um, so I can just throw those out there as well, uh, putting people on the spot a little bit. So um, we can start with quite straightforward question in a way, but probably a complicated answer, I can imagine, um, based on what we've heard so far. Um, if a city or town would like to put up an urban airport, how should they go about it? So I'll start to, to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, get in touch, you know, is the first key um, key thing. Um, what we're trying to demonstrate through Coventry is um, how local authorities or what local authorities need to do um, in order to uh, start their journey along, you know, incorporating air mobility into their, uh, into their towns and cities. Um, it's a really long and complicated question if we start to go into the details of what is needed but obviously um it I, I, you know there will there'll be certain silos that it sits in so there are there are um physical characteristics that need to be met within a city um there's then obviously the air what we call the air architecture or permitting side um, that uh, needs to be in place. So some areas of a city just, you know, may not be accessible from a point of view of um, um, restricted flight zones, etc. cetera. Um, so you may look at a location and say that it's particularly suitable from, from the ground, you know, it sits next to a, an existing hub, transportation hub, et cetera. Um, but then obviously it needs to be assessed from its accessibility from the air, of course. Um, so there, there are many, many different things. Then obviously regulation at the moment is in, the, in its infancy, but um, um, planning an actual um, regulation for permission to build in any, any um, uh, area, even if it's um, physically suitable and then possible from the point of view of, of um, uh, actually reaching it from a, a UTM point of view, um, then obviously planning and, um, uh, uh, and, and those types of regulation need to be in place too. And then there's business case and, and all of those kind of things to be built in. So it is a very complex um, uh, question that, that re requires a complex answer. I, I think the simplest bit is the bit that I said at the beginning is, you know, if you are interested, that's obviously the reason why we're, you know, one of the reasons why we're here speaking today is that we would like as many um, uh, partners to approach us as possible that are interested in, in, in uh, 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 implicating or, or, or implementing it rather into their cities and not just local authorities but also private owners so I, I said in the presentation real estate developers logistics um, distribution centers hotels you know I, it really the, the applications are quite limitless um, so yeah if anybody's you know um, interested in particular to go through that in more detail over a longer call, then um, please get in touch and, you know, we'd be happy to uh, set that up. Super, thank you, Stuart. I see that a couple more questions are pinged in through the chat, so I'll take them next. Um, first from Ravi, I think this was sent to me directly, um, again, again for Stuart, is Urban Airport looking at US-based US operations anytime soon? Yes, we are. Um, we're not, there is nowhere that we're, you know, that we're not looking to, uh, to go to, um, uh, our partnership with Hyundai and mobility, um, uh, allows us obviously to look at the U S market, um, you know, in, in, 
in more detail in particular. So yes, we're, we're looking at use cases specifically, specific use cases in the US already. Um, and it's one of the markets that for sure um, is, you know, is going to be uh, one of the largest in the future. It's also, um, you know, particularly suitable in lots of um, in lots of use cases being you know as Matt said there are specific examples already such as downtown Manhattan to JFK or the or San Francisco Bay Area or Los Angeles where uh, already there are um, live trials or, or um, paper tri trials at the moment that will become live trials in place so the US market is something that um, is very important to us yeah Super, thank you. Oh, yeah, Matthew, Alan, please. Just, yeah, one quick thing just to add on that. I think um, one thing that I didn't mention in our presentation is just the, the similar sort of scope and geography that we're um, also looking to, to serve with um, our vehicles. And, you know, I think as we look at the, the global footprint for Hyundai, you know, we, we certainly wouldn't close any geographies off. Um, but, you, you know, the question is really kind of how to sequence those geographies. And so, you know, certainly in the United States, where that's where we'll be certifying the vehicle, there's a lot of interesting um, locations. And then I think, you know, another area that really has made uh, other geographies stand out for us is, is their friendliness to the business case and um, their willingness to take some risk with us on, on this business case. And in that sense, really kind of lean in on how do we create the right kind of urban planning environment for, um, for rolling out the, the vehicle. And so I think that's largely been the center of gravity for for many of the conversations we've had outside of the core kind of market sizing exercises that we've done um, but of course phoebe has us both beat uh, by having global coverage already yeah uh i agree on that i guess yeah uh you can use us anywhere in the world uh including the ocean so uh uh definitely recommend downloading the app and giving it a go <laughs> thank you uh, all of you, uh, thank you for that one. And um, uh, a follow-up question again from Yap, actually. Um, for Stuart and Matt, do you see a role for regional airports in your vision of the future urban airspace system? These smaller airports seem to be forgotten as an unavailable asset at the moment. Do you want to go first, Matt, or I, I can? Yeah, go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, I mean, very much not forgotten. They are a key part of the future infrastructure, um, particularly for regional air mobility. Um, you know, connecting um, uh, places with with large with longer distance flight, with uh, you know, in, uh, including the vehicles such as the Hyundai SA1 that has a fixed wing and is actually able to do those those larger distances. Um, we any any sites are possible, but uh, regional airports are particularly suited because they're already set up for um, for aviation. And so uh, they're a key potential site for regional air mobility hubs in the future. And they also provide um, you know, additional benefits such as connecting not just each other, but connecting to larger airports. So the larger airports themselves can then spread their um, uh, potential area of coverage through air mobility. So rather than driving to the big airport, you drive to the to the smaller regional airport. That's where, or hopefully you don't drive actually, but you travel somehow um, uh, uh, with zero uh, emission to the regional airport, and then use a, a air mobility to connect to the larger um, airport to to continue your your, your longer journey. So uh, we're talking to lots of regional airports, and actually, air mobility also has the uh, possibility to help those regional airports in terms of their wider business case in the future. So where they may have been struggling and forgotten in the past for traditional aviation, then uh, urban air mobility and advanced air mobility may be able to provide them an additional revenue stream that actually will, you know, will help them um, for their for their own individual business case in the future. Yeah, and just to echo that, I think we also view regional airports as a critical cornerstone to the infrastructure business case for urban air mobility or advanced air mobility. And, you know, it's particularly interesting, I think, for us here in the United States, where we have something like 5,000 airports, but 70% of the passenger traffic flows over one of the top 10. And so what that means is we have a lot of nascent airports, and there is a vision in the 1960s for us to basically have 
airplane ownership, small airplane ownership be similar in, in manner to what cars had become in the United States at the time. Of course, that never really materialized for a variety of reasons. Um, but, you know, with the advent of, of this technology, it, it really kind of helps bring all that infrastructure back into the picture. Um, and it's a lot easier to operate at a, at a facility that is already purpose built for aviation. You know, I think the challenges that, that we see with them are kind of twofold. One, there's not really much physical infrastructure there um, by way of terminal or passenger infrastructure, which is really where I think the urban airport folks and ourselves have a big role to play in, in building those out and making them quite useful. Um, and then I think the second issue is, is really one of um, ground mobility and, and regional connectivity within a certain city or, or region because a lot of these airports are a little bit more rural. They don't tend to be connected, um, you know, by definition with large kind of dense transportation networks. And so then we're gonna be leaning in on things like on-demand ride sharing or alternate, um, you know, ground micromobility solutions. And I think that's where things like autonomous ground vehicles mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the whole platform approach are, are really important to, to creating the viability of, of those networks. No, thank you both. And uh, and I see the Yaps reply there. Good to hear that regional airports are, are part of the whole story. So super. Um, just uh, I'll go on to one of the, the questions I received earlier. Um, I think this is probably for, largely for Matt. I think probably uh, Stuart can also chip in. Sorry, people, perhaps a little bit less for you, I would say, on this one. But um, what is a typical use case for advanced air mobility? Who'd be flying? Where would they be going? How much would a seat cost? Th those kind of things. Yeah, great, great question. I think, you know, this comes back to the emergency services piece, but, you know, I think there are uh, uh, many use cases for this. I, I will say, though, um, you know, we're being pretty realistic about what we think those use cases are, and we don't want to assume that anyone and everyone will, will make use of this transportation system kind of in isolation, because there are a lot of reasons that ground-based vehicles or other things make more sense. Um, and that's why it's, it's you know, one, one of many kind of tools in the toolkit. But, you know, I think the, you know, the classic example of um, trying to improve like productivity of a business trip is probably kind of the most um, near term thing for us. And, and kind of two reasons for that. One, um, time is kind of fundamentally most valued, I think, in, in a direct way by, by companies, right? And so uh, those corporate clients can basically make use of, you know, flying from, you know, a major airport. So if you fly into JFK and you need to get to Manhattan and then you fly out of Newark later that night, it's quite difficult to make all those ground transfers work. I think anyone that's done a business trip in Los Angeles and had to be in more than one place would certainly attest to um, needing to move around very quickly and basically planning like whole swaths of days. So an AM or a PM just to get somewhere and spend like time with one person. Um, so, so that's, those are the kinds of cases that I, that I think are most near term. And then I think, you know, over time, um, you know, we certainly start to see other, other use cases as well. Um, you know, and I think, um, things like sporting events, right. Where it's hard to get, you know, people in and out of a, of a facility, um, particularly if they're, they're coming from far away, you know, those are the kinds of journeys that start to become possible. Um, whereas, you know, on a typical Tuesday night, you're, you're probably not going to, not going to do that unless you can dedicate an entire afternoon, but, you know, um, so, so really kind of starting with both business travel and, um, you know, high value leisure, I guess is the way to put it. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'll add, I'll add just while you're waiting oh. for more questions to come in. So, um, you know, we, um, those are, uh, as Matt said, you know, main sorts of business cases, but just to sort of, you know, fire imagination a little bit more in terms of where things will go in the future. We think that it has big roles to play in, in tourism, that it has 
um, big roles to play. I mean, it depends if you're talking about passenger or logistics again or disaster, you know, because often we're answering these questions from a sort of global point of view, but um, actually you need to look in, into the individual markets and how they can be applied to the different use cases. Um, but eventually, you know, the, the ultimate aim for this is, is even, you know, personal ownership of, of Evatol. Um, it's maybe a, a lot longer, you know, further away in the future. Um, but uh, as I say, you know, to kind of fire your imagination that you'll be actually able to go and get in your own vehicle and go somewhere. So I think, you know, ultimately, all of the solutions that we have to talk about need to be more practical uh, and um, focus on, on ride sharing and focus on opening up uh, or improving existing corridors and, and, and those types of things. But actually, I think that eventually, you know, when it's uh, possible or, or in the next few years when it's possible um, for you to go and take a, a journey somewhere in an Evatol, there will even be a, a large number of people that do it just for the, for the um, sake of the journey, uh, that that part of the trip will be the most enjoyable part of the journey for them. So you may decide that you want to go away to a, you know, to a nearby city for a, for a weekend and the way that you're going to do that uh, that journey is by Evatol, and actually taking that journey um, uh, in a in a in an electric aircraft is going to be the part that you remember the most about that whole you know long weekend away that you treated yourself or your family to. So um, the use cases are really not not completely unlimited, but they have a very very wide range of applications in the future. Um, uh, you know tourism as i say not just connecting to tourist locations but even using the evatol itself as a, a as a means for tourism for absolutely uh, contactless tourism within an, you know within an area such as helicopters flying over the grand canyon for instance so th there are a, a massive range of potential use cases they will obviously come later uh, than uh, the, the, the more viable ones that will be adopted in the early terms because they need to be viable in order to to be paid for um, but eventually as the uh, as the networks grow wider and wider and the app the, the um, application becomes uh, more widespread then those use cases themselves can can increase even further thank you Stuart um something else that, that popped in we were we're seeing, I'm obviously most familiar with Sweden, but uh, also I think similarly in, in, in Norway, in Finland, probably perhaps to a lesser extent in Denmark, I'd have thought. You've got a lot of, quite a lot of land, quite a lot of uh, bits of land with lot, relatively few people in, some you know, reasonably sized cities, some smaller towns, a lot of forest, some mountainous areas, a lot of lakes, that kind of thing. Um, where do you see the big benefits will be coming. I mean, I'm thinking things like you know, on the on the logistic side in particular. You know, a lot of times people might have to drive quite a long way just to get to, to the pharmacy. Um, where do you see things the, the big the big benefits coming in? I think perhaps you can all chip in there. Let's we'll start with let's uh, we'll start with Phoebe. You haven't had much to say. I don't much chance just lately, Phoebe. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously we are just an addressing system, but we you know we have seen huge benefits coming. Um, you know, in areas of South Africa, which where areas, you know, people living in townships previously didn't have a, a, an address and a way to communicate where they are, now are able to, you know, have a pizza delivered, which is, you know, very low entry, but also are able to, um, you know, have an emergency service, be able to find them very, very quickly. Um, so being able to provide that addressing infrastructure um, has we've seen kind of change people's lives and I, I think providing an urban mobility uh, solution that means that these people's access to both services and you know other larger communities will also have a huge impact on, on you know, changing people's lives and how they interact with with different services available um, I think that's that will be really interesting to see And maybe, you know, I think over COVID, I think we've seen more and more people move away from the city. Um, and, you know, will this facilitate that even further? Um, you know, people being further away is, uh, you know, there is less of a necessity to be living in cities if you live near an urban airport and can travel using a Hyundai uh, EV toll. <laughs> yeah, I think, um you know, completely agree. I think what's particularly interesting about this case is the sort of unlimited potential of it 
right? And, and similar to what we saw with um, iPhone, Web 2.0, what we, I think, expect to see with Web 3.0 and, and many of the technologies that will enable it, you know, we, we don't know, right? We can't anticipate, I think, so many of the, of the interesting use cases. And I think they will um, come from enterprising entrepreneurs and, and in, you know, other folks and just demand from, from customers. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's really promising to see the growth that we've seen in the, in the drone space recently. So Google Wing, um, I think conducting, you know, a couple hundred thousand deliveries um, directly to consumers with its drones. Um, MANA in Ireland is running a quite a full, full scale trial. Um, and so there, there are a number of, of those types of things. I think that that adoption um, continues to grease the skids for us to, to really come in and, and find um, those unique use cases. So I think that's part of why it's, um, it's a little bit difficult to anticipate what we know right um, at a kind of first principles level. So that a lot of people take, take car journeys today and you know, a lot of people take walking journeys, but the average journey is about three miles from their house. Um, you know, and, and what we've seen like in the leisure airline space kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum is if we, you know, lower fares enough will we'll pull people off of their couches to go on vacations. And so I think the question is, you know, what are those opportunities and how do we, how do we make them happen? But, um, you know, first things first, we, we have to build the ecosystem, we have to build the, the vehicle. And I think we're going to see some really, really unique applications coming out of that. Yeah, you know, I, I would only add that, you know, the question really is very um, pertinent to the geography that we're talking about. And, and that's really why I think, you know, we uh, put the, the panel together as it is today. It's the combination of the of the technologies and the building of these partnerships that uh, are um, particularly suitable to um, sparsely populated uh, populations. So, you know, throughout the Nordic region, a network of urban airports then combined with um, uh, what three words technology can cover a much wider area for a fraction of the cost of the uh, installation of traditional infrastructure. So any you know isolated community um, that, um, uh, as you say, needs deliveries in the future of, of, of whatever it may be, is going to be able to do that in the future with their mobility quickly and and from a uh, from a point of, of zero emissions um, because uh, the the communication of the location is is already in place the um, uh, infrastructure is very close to being uh, developed at least in in its first iterations and that will obviously improve and, and increase in, in in all locations and then the oems are very very rapidly developing um, the vehicles. So it's not going to be so long, uh, as I said in the timeline in my presentation, that we can combine these technologies, these you know, three technologies in this case, and bring them into a location uh, such as the, the uh, various Nordic countries. And that has the chance to really, really change people's lives. You know, um, as Phoebe said, maybe we've learned during the pandemic that it isn't necessary to go to the office every day. If you're not going to the office every day, then you do need to reverse that uh, that uh, uh, journey in some instances because you still need supplies and food and things that you would have bought when you were going into the city. And so air mobility is allowing actually the changes that have, have occurred in the last few years, you know, partly driven by COVID, but they were already in place before that. They just got accelerated by the pandemic to, to happen. So um, the question is a really great one for this panel and for this particular conference because we hope and expect that the Nordic region will be one of the, the key early adopters of, of this technology and obviously that's the reason why we're all here today because we very much want to see that happen in the same way that it's already happened with EV vehicles um, in this region we would like to see that happen with EV tolls. Thanks. Uh, actually, another question is pinged in in the chat. Uh, this, is from, this time from Chris. And I think uh, he's bringing up STOL, which I think stands for short takeoff and landing. Um, so how would the introduction of STOL and electrification of smaller manned aircraft impact the use of EVTOLs for regional and urban applications? So I guess you've got sort of uh, similar and, uh, well, not similar, but similar usage and, and competing technology there. Uh, where do you think that will impact? 
Yeah, um, maybe I can start with that and let let the others jump in. You know, I think our view of this space is kind of two different use cases. So regional air mobility, electrification, hybrid, hydrogen, uh, powertrains that all can go to kind of near-term applications for call it sub 500 nautical mile flights is a slightly different use case than um, electric vertical takeoff and landing. And I think what we've what we've seen is you basically need EV toll to serve um, dense urban populations for basically noise reasons and also for um, infrastructure reasons. So it's it's really difficult to build a, a Berta port for a traditional helicopter because you have to have things like fire suppression systems, you have to have a supply chain for fuel. Um, it's just kind of considerably messier and, and much noisier and cities just don't, don't want that. So I think you need um, the technology around eVTOL to make something urban work. And then, you know, what we've seen is that it's just given the existing technologies in the space, it is pretty difficult to extend the range um, and capacity of those vehicles um, to be much longer than, you know, call it 100, 150 nautical miles um, today. And so anything beyond that, you know, we're still in the kind of that regional air mobility space. And I think there, you know, there's a really significant existing marketplace that, that already exists um, for hub to spoke traffic, particularly feeding longer haul flying. Um, and I think there's the, the, the dense opportunity that exists in the regional air mobility space is, is point to point kind of regional airport to regional airport um, as well. And so huge opportunities there. I think that's, that's something that we are certainly not closed off to looking at. And you know, the EV toll that we're building now is probably the first of several vehicles that we're um, you know, going to look to introduce over a, a longer period of time, kind of a product roadmap um, that, that will sort of eventually be there. Um, so we certainly see a lot of potential in it, you know, particularly on the short field takeoff and landing piece, I think the jury is still out. The reality is once you, you know, you basically would do it to enable kind of bigger capacities and, and longer ranges. But at some point, you know, there's a question of how many more use cases can you get out of East stall um, or stall in general than you can get out of just a, a conventional kind of re, re engine or re engineered um, regional aircraft that's considerably more efficient than what we have today. Um, and I think, you know, the places where we, we see that as being kind of an interesting use case are potentially things like logistics facilities where you've got enough space and you could build, you know, a short, very short runway in those types of places. Um, it's pretty hard to do that in the urban core. So, you know, you, you are still talking about more regional um, applications, but potentially more like pop-up um, applications for, again, kind of like logistics areas or uh, even kind of regional towns. So certainly for Burning Man, that would help a lot, I think. Um, but, you, you know, jury is still out on that. I think it, it probably depends also on, you know, what the performance trades are and just how short your, your short field performance is. But certainly something that I think we and other folks in this space will, will continue to look at. Yeah, I would, I would only echo the same thing that, you know, we don't want to um, uh, uh, say anything negative against East dollars as, as a solution, but would only say that, you know, from an EV toll point of view, the advantages that it has are exactly as Matt said, that we're able to get into more constrained um, urban locations in the center of the city. So actually what we're building in Coventry behind me is right in the center of the city. Um, and you know that's the most um, uh, the highest value land of, of any uh, urban area. And so it's difficult therefore to justify taking any more land than you than you need. you know the actual reason for the whole um, design of the technology that as we've done it is to have everything in the one place, taking the, 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 the smallest amount of land um, uh, that, that we can um, and having all of the, the systems and everything in place within that location so that Evitol lands in exactly the place where it's going to be processed, charged, maintained, stored, etc. cetera. Um, so the, the difference there with Eastol is obviously that you, you need a runway, even though it's a small runway. And if you have a runway, then it, it means that it's taking more land. And potentially also from a from a uh, from a noise point of view, etc. If you're not if you're not landing vertically, then obviously you're not able to, to or you have a different flight profile coming into the into the um, uh, city 
than you do from an evitol. So th there are reasons why evitol is a, is a, or there are areas where evitol is a more suitable solution. There are uh, those areas where that solution actually is probably not so necessary, which as Matt said, you know, in a rural location or some a place where the land take is not so important that maybe an Eastol might have a, uh, a better solution than an Evatol if its range is, is better or, or its payload is better. Um, but what we need to see is where those Eastols have better range or payload in order to make them, you know, uh, uh, a better or more viable solution than, than just an evitol that, you know, there are obviously a huge number of evitols already being um, developed, uh, perhaps because they're more um, flexible in, in those ways that I've just highlighted, and, and maybe fewer estol because they have these, these some limitations that, that don't over and above make them a, a better solution from, um, uh, from what an evitol is able to give you. Sorry, just trying to find the mute button there. Um, and I see Chris has added a, a thank you there for, for the answers there. Um, I think one last thing, we're getting probably towards the end of, I think, the discussion, but I think something to just wrap up with perhaps. Um, Everybody feel, feel free to chip in, but uh, it's perhaps probably most suitable for Stuart, I'd have thought. Um, what are the biggest challenges, or if you rather, what are your top tips for anyone in the audience that's looking to contribute to building this this advanced air mobility ecosystem i guess matt could chip in too here i would say um what, what would you be your top tips for, if you're starting from scratch based on your experience so far where, where are the best places to start the, the very much the foundation blocks actually i'll answer it from the challenges point of view first of all um you know any new type of infrastructure is 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 um extremely uh capital heavy, expenditure heavy in the first instance before you're able to get to the point of it being a, um, a profitable um, operation. And that is obviously the biggest uh, hurdle at this stage for the whole industry. Um, what we're trying to do with our solution is to make it as easy for any interested customer to implement a, uh, a an air mobility solution. Um, it may, you know, not look like this in 10 or 20 years time, but where we are in the market at the moment, in order to be able to adopt this uh, as it stands now at the, at the kind of lowest level of expenditure, we feel that this is the best solution for any interested partner to be able to do that. So that the, the top tips are kind of all, all integrated into the solution that we've, you know, that we've designed um, in order to, you know, hit those, uh, hit those hurdles or, or jump those hurdles even um, as best as possible. Anybody that's interested, I would encourage to, you know, to, to contact us. Um, we are a, uh, a sort of honeypot for all of these potential partnerships, you know, in, including uh, the main one with Hyundai um, that we're able to bring together. So uh, all those hurdles, including, as I say, regulation and all of those things we touched upon er earlier, are able to be met by different um, uh, different players within the ecosystem. So um, I would say the top tip would be uh, collaboration between the, the various partners um, uh, and, and being open to bringing in as many of those necessary partners as, a, a, as is necessary at this stage and a desire to um, actually start this journey, uh, you know, and start this journey now because it's not something that can be implemented overnight. It's going to take a number of years, even if you start looking now before you have an operational vertiport in place. Um, and so to meet the timeline of the OEMs in order to you know, have infrastructure in place for when those vehicles are able to fly in the next three to five years, uh, we would encourage everybody to start thinking about that as a, as a, um, uh, a solution that they can start to put into their uh, into their smart cities now, rather than you know waiting uh, and missing out in the future. Yeah, I'd just echo that, Stuart, on the collaboration point. And I think it's something that Matt mentioned earlier in his presentation. You know, it's not there are so many different components in order to bring air mobility about. Um, I mean, this panel is just an example of that. Um, but you know, when we've been working in the drone space, it's it's you know been 
um, sort of part of consortia is whether it's, you know, you need the existing log logistics networks, the drone companies, the softwares, um, and then, you know, we're coming from a, from a addressing standpoint, um, but, you know, looking at air mobility, there's going to be legislation, infrastructure, and the actual air mobility, um, and then the softwares and, and the, you know, addressing from our standpoint, standpoint. So I think it's very much about collaboration and finding those adequate uh, and you know, the correct partners and, and the ones to, to move everything forward. Yeah, I um, completely agree with, with both um, Stuart and Phoebe. I would only add that, you know, I, I think of the urban air mobility business case somewhat similarly to the very early days of uh, Pan American Airways and, and, you know, thinking about kind of how one trip and um, the team over there was able to kind of stitch together a, a global network. And what they did was basically what they could do, right? So they um, started with, I think, um, you know, an airmail route between Miami and Havana, and then, um, you know, eventually expanded into South America because that's what the airplanes could reach. And then, you know, eventually they start to look at flying the Atlantic and flying the Pacific. Pacific actually comes first. And what they do is they build infrastructure on islands across the, the Pacific. And so it's incredibly difficult. Um, there are a lot of um, barriers. Most people would think it's completely impossible. Um, I think the, you know, the huge advantages that we have today are um, certainly technology advancements, but also um, you know, this, this really great kind of venture ecosystem um, and, uh, and kind of incumbent ecosystem that is you know, built on a uh, hundred and more years of progress, um, you know, across the board. And so, you know, we're, we're living in an environment where people, um, you know, are, are encouraged to take risks and encouraged to, to um, you know, really try really hard things and, and do moonshot like things. And so I think, um, you know, practically speaking, the, the best way to, to address that problem is, is just to jump in and to, to really start solving, you know, an individual corner of that. Um, and I think, you know, we're probably near peak, peak hype curve on the urban air mobility um, business case right now. And I think that's great because what it means is we've gotten a lot of people excited, a lot more people kind of coming into the sector um, and I think there are many, many ways to, to be involved, um, you know, from the regulatory end um, to working directly in the EV tool space to, you know, building services that support them. Um, and so I, I think, you know, uh, look around, have some, some open-ended conversations and, um, you know, I think you'll, you'll likely find good direction on how to go. Super, well, thank you very much. I think uh, there don't seem to be any more questions in the chat that I can see. So I think uh, we can probably wrap up around here. Um, unless anybody has any final comments at all. I'd, I'd just say okay. thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you for organizing. Thank you for moderating. And uh, um, yeah, thank you for everybody that uh, has come along to, to, to see us speak. Yes, thank you. And then for my part, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, to Phoebe, to Matt, and to Stuart, and to all of the audience. Uh, I hope you found it uh, an interesting, stimulating uh, topic of discussion. Um, I certainly have. I look forward to you know, keeping contact with the with the speakers over over, over the coming uh, months and, and so on, and then there's particularly to see how the Coventry uh, installation develops. Um, if anybody's come up with any questions after the fact, uh, please feel free to send them to me. I can pass them on to to the relevant speaker. Um, or indeed, if you want to make you know, contacts, uh, connections, and yeah, I didn't catch any contact details, I'm happy to do the same there as well. Otherwise, thank you very much for today, and uh, we'll call it a day. Bye bye. Thank you, Alan. Thanks so much, Alan. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye bye.